in tonight's lesson, we're going to be looking at a kind of a different aspect of uh, the death, burial, and resurrection concept. Now, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul, as he would always teach, uh, let us know that the thing he was mainly interested in is preaching the gospel. What is the gospel? And so in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, and which I preach to you, which you've received, and which you are, which you stand, and by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. I deliver to you, he said, first of all, that which I also received, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, that's the good news about Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Uh, don't run out of those, Leon. You want to have some on the other side there, too. Okay. And so uh, that's sometimes referred to as the euangelion, uh, good news. And so we often refer to people obeying the gospel. In fact, that's always a thing that as we're talking to different individuals or we're talking about different individuals, we ask if someone has obeyed the gospel. But the thing about the gospel is we're looking at news. And how do you obey news? For example, if you hear today about so many people that were killed in Iraq, uh, how do you obey that or how do you disobey it? You can't really obey news. And so how do you obey the gospel? <laughs> we're told in 2 Thessalonians 1 that uh, it says there to the Lord would be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and the flaming fire taking vengeance on those that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there must be a way you can obey the gospel or conversely, disobey the gospel. How do you do it? Well, of course, the gospel has to be placed inside some other form for you to be able to either obey or disobey, and that form is the doctrine. That cup that it fits into is the doctrine. And that's why we look in Romans chapter 6, and we read there about those who obeyed from their heart that form of doctrine. Again, there's the word form. We looked at this morning, form or, or pattern of doctrine. And so they looked at that, and they obeyed, all of the things that are centered around not only the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, but what all is involved in that. And that is that he died on the cross for my sins. I have sins. I need my sins cleansed and washed away. How do I do that? Well, that's through obeying the gospel. And so I can appropriate that blood of Jesus Christ into my life, which we all know. Revelation 1, 5, that blood which, which cleanses us and which we praise God for every day of our life, and as each year goes by, you praise God more for it. Uh, the salvation we enjoy gets more precious, I think, uh, to me, and gets more precious every day, and I'm sure it does to you as well. So there you have the gospel. But we talk a lot about Jesus' uh, death. We talk a lot about his death. Talk about his death on the cross. There are many sermons that are preached about that. Somebody today preached about Jesus' death on the cross somewhere in the Lord's church. I can guarantee that probably not far from here, because you just don't get away from the cross of Jesus Christ. So we talk about his death a lot. Seven statements from the cross. That's one of the most popular sermons that every preacher has in their repertoire. And every preacher probably has not only the seven statements you can preach all in one Sunday if you need to for a gospel meeting, but you can break them apart and use them for seven different Sundays if you need to. Death of Jesus, talked about a lot. Where would we be without the death of Christ? We'd be lost, that's where we'd be. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Resurrection of Jesus, we talk about it all the time. Of course we do. And uh, we should, we should talk about the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, most of us who are here tonight, that accountable people, have been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, the like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us, uh, not the uh, cleansing of the flesh in the sense of the, the filth of the flesh, as he points out, but it is the, uh, the interrogation of or the answer of a good conscience toward God, and that is by or through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And so what animates our spiritual life, what causes us to be able to have life uh, in a spiritual sense, and what causes our baptism to be powerful and viable is the fact that Jesus arose from the grave. Uh, I think I've mentioned this before, but I remember once studying with some individuals from the Latter-day Saints Church, and those individuals, I was talking to them, and uh, I said something about Christ's death on the cross, and I'll never forget what they said. They said, uh, I don't care that Christ died. I thought, well, what a terrible thing to say. And then the person followed up and said, I care that he arose. Well, we care that Christ died and that he arose, but it is a fact that if Jesus dies on the cross and he did not arise from the grave, 
we would be in a terrible fix. And so it's certainly natural for us to talk about the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And a lot of our song books and our songs and our song books, Up from the Grave He Arose and, and, and many things along that line, we sing those songs. So you have that, but then we don't spend a lot of time, though, about the burial of Christ, do we? I don't think we hear a lot of sermons about that, Christ's burial. Well, tonight, let's talk about that. Let's talk about Jesus' tomb, Jesus' burying place, and look at some things that we can gain from all of that. Uh, the first thing we would point out regarding this is that it certainly is talked about in the Word of God. I'd like to focus on two of those passages in particular, not that we want to do any injustice to Matthew's uh, account, but if you look at Mark 15, 42 through 47, and then look at John, what is said there. First of all, let's turn to Mark. Mark chapter 15, and in that particular passage, beginning with 42, when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, he was a prominent council member. Now, over the years, you know, he's had a reputation of being a wealthy man. Uh, must have had a wealthy man, been a wealthy man, because he has his own tomb, uh, a new tomb, and he gives that to Jesus. Uh, little did he know he could have just rented it out to Jesus because he's not going to need it very long, is he? So, but he gives that tomb to it. And so for all practical purposes, if he were looking at this from a materialistic viewpoint, Jesus would be living there today in that same tomb. But I have a suspicion, knowing Joseph of Arimathea's faith that seems like it's grown, he's probably thinking that tomb might not be inhabited very long. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I would not purport to know what Joseph was thinking when he does what he does. But... He gets more courage because he was waiting for the kingdom of God. What kind of kingdom of God? I believe he's waiting for a spiritual kingdom of God. And the reason why I'm saying that is because if he were looking at a physical kingdom of God, the man who was going to be responsible for that already passed away. And if he's already passed away, I don't know that you're going to be able to marshal any forces together while you're a dead man. And so I don't think he's looking at something materialistic, but a spiritual kingdom. I think that's what he's thinking about right now. So he, he has some faith, and so he has garnered his faith up, and he's gotten stronger, and he's taking courage. So he's gotten encouraged or filled with courage. And he goes to Pilate and asks for the body of Jesus. Now, I don't think that would be an easy thing to do, to go. I think you've got to go through several steps to be able to go. If you wanted to have an audience today with Governor Blanco, uh, and have a conference with her. How would you go about doing that? I have no idea. I have no idea. There are some people here who are a lot smarter than me on governmental affairs, and you wouldn't have an idea probably, but I, I think you still, as smart as you are, you'd probably have to go through several channels to get from point A over to point Z, which would be actually sitting in her office and meeting with her. So I don't think it's easy to go and do that now. I know it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be back then either. But he does that. And uh, Pilate marveled that he was already dead, that Jesus was already dead. And um, wouldn't you like to know the background behind that? I, I don't know what that means. He marveled that Jesus was already dead. I don't know that anyone fully knows what that means. Maybe he thought, with this Jesus that I've heard so much about, I didn't know that he would be killed this easily. <laughs> I thought this would be somebody that, that would go on living for a long time. But he's already dead. And so he summoned the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. They found out from the centurion, that, and then he granted the body to Jesus. And then he brought uh, fine linen, bought fine linen, took him down, wrapped him in the linen, laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus, or Joseph, uh, observed where he was laid. And so... Uh, so you see that this uh, passage then talks about the burial of Christ. And then let's notice John 19, 38 through 42. John 19, 38 through 42. Similar passage, of course. Starting with 38, after this, Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Christ, but secretly, secretly, we'll talk about that more later, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus and Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body of Jesus. I thought Nicodemus was involved in all this, didn't you? He was, because this next verse says, Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night. Oh, we know him. We remember him well. He came, and he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. And they took the body of Jesus, bound it in strips of linen and spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. 
and in the place uh, where he was crucified there was a garden and in the garden there was a new tomb which had no one there who'd been laid and so there they laid Jesus because of the Jews preparation day for the tomb was nearby two beautiful passages that talk there and give us a, uh, a graphic description of what's going on concerning the death of Jesus Christ now with that in mind let's take a look at some points that I want to share with you this evening it won't take very long we'll go through this but I want you to take a look at it with me because these are some powerful points I believe First of all, this uh, burying place, his tomb, fulfills scripture. There are many scriptures about Jesus, many prophecies, I should say, about Jesus. Uh, it's been estimated maybe 300 in all. Uh, some of those could have been fulfilled purposely by Jesus. Uh, you, you could make some of those come true. But some of those could not have been just purposely fulfilled by Jesus. You, you can't really determine what all is going to go on in the theater of operation when you're dying on a cross, can you? I mean, there's a lot of things there. I can't make the soldiers go ahead and cast lots for my garments, but that was prophesied. You know, I, I can't uh, cause people to blaspheme me on, when I'm dying on the cross, but that's prophesied and revile against me when I'm dying on the cross. That was prophesied. That was fulfilled. And it was also this, this incredible prophecy in Isaiah 53, 9. Notice what is said here in Isaiah 53, 9. That he would make his grave, the suffering servant, would make his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. You see, you've got to see the, the evolution of people who suffer as it moves through the Old Testament time periods. First of all, anyone who suffers is bad. The next line of reasoning is not all people who suffer are bad. Job taught us that. And then Isaiah springs a powerful truth on us through the Holy Spirit's inspiration. Some people who suffer are not only saints, but they are sanctified from Almighty God and they are the anointed Jesus Christ. And so you suffering, those who are suffering aren't always doing that because they're bad, but they may be the actual Son of God. And so Isaiah gives us that powerful truth. And in Isaiah 53, 9, he made his grave with the wicked. And we read about that, don't we? In Matthew 27, 44, uh, you had the two male factors. I still love that old term, King James Version, male factors. Uh, one of our instructors in the school of preaching, when he was a little boy, asked his preacher what a male factor was. He said, that's just two male Christians it was talking about. Not exactly. <laughs> not, not exactly. But those were the thieves on either side of Jesus. Jesus in a position of, of, uh, of, of just a humiliation as he is in the middle of these two thieves. And according to Matthew 27, 44, Matthew's account lets us know that they both reviled against him. But then look at Luke 23, 39 through 43. You want to see a different picture now. In Luke 23, one of those thieves, he got to looking at things a little bit different. Uh, one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him and saying, if you're the Christ, save yourselves and us. Now what he's looking for is physical salvation. And I can see why he would do that. The other one rebuked him and says, do you not even fear God? What's he saying? Jesus is God. Jesus is God. He's smart. He knows what's going on, doesn't he? He may be dying on a cross because he's supposed to die on a cross, but he knows this man right next to him, his next door neighbor dying here with him, is no ordinary man. This is God that we're killing today. And so he says, don't you fear God, seeing you're under the same condemnation? We're all going to be dead when this is over. That's what crosses do. Crosses don't just discipline people. Now, don't you get down from there and don't do that again. No, you don't get down from there. You're carried out of there because you're dead, and that's what the purpose is. We die justly. But for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And of course, Jesus says, today you're going to be with me in paradise. From the original language, a beautiful garden. You're going to be with me in a beautiful garden. How ironic. The life of man begins in a beautiful garden. Jesus said you're going to a beautiful garden, which is a description of the Hadean rim, uh, the, the good place, the place where the righteous go. And so Jesus goes there, and this man goes with him, because Jesus saves him from his sins. But he made his grave with the wicked. They had those individuals on either side of him, and one of those that was wicked had a penitent heart and changed his life. But now also with the rich at his death. And if you were to examine the lives of Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, you're looking at men who apparently were fairly well-to-do. Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews, and so that was a position of great popularity. 
and with it a position that probably had some financial prosperity that was associated. Joseph of Arimathea has his own tomb, and so not everybody had that. You know, they had their own type potter's field situations there where people would sometimes be buried if you didn't have a place. And so uh, he wasn't one of those people. Apparently not only had his own tomb, but he was able to give that away and probably could dig down into his pocket and buy another tomb if he needed to. So he was fairly well to do. And so Jesus made his grave with the wicked and was with the rich at his death. And so that's a powerful prophecy that was fulfilled. Secondly, his tomb was a borrowed tomb. Nobody ever had room for Jesus. There was no room in the end for him. So uh, he ends up being taken to this this barn, and he ends up being, being born and then laid in a, a feeding trough. That's where our Savior begins his life on earth. And he didn't own that. He didn't own the place where he was, uh, was born. So they didn't have a place for him there. There was no place for him as far as the Samaritan village, that time when he was going through. They got angry with him because it looked like he was heading toward Jerusalem. Well, if you're going to do that way, we don't want you here. Don't want you here or your disciples. And actually, the disciples were the ones who you know, made the inquisition, and then they came back to Jesus, and they're hopping mad about the whole thing. And then Jesus just says, don't worry about it. You know, we're going to go on to the next town. You know, we're not of the Spirit to go and burn these people down and their village down. But no room for him there. No room for him there. There's no room for him today in a lot of places. No room for Jesus in school. Now, you can have drugs. You can teach people uh, about um, uh, things uh, such as uh, abortion and how that might be an acceptable thing to do if somebody gets in trouble. Uh, you can teach all about different ways that keep young ladies from getting uh, impregnated in case they do decide to go ahead and get involved in sexuality at an early age. You can do all of those things. And I wouldn't be surprised if our schools don't do more to glorify the Islamic religion because we're such babies and afraid that we're going to offend somebody. But we don't have room for Jesus. We don't have room for Jesus. We kicked him out in 1963 and we're not letting him back in yet. And so uh, there's a lot of places where Jesus is not welcome. And a lot of things Jesus had to borrow, he borrowed. So he borrows a place to be born. He borrows a boat to preach from. He borrowed a donkey to ride on in Jerusalem. And he ends up borrowing a tomb as our Savior didn't even have his own tomb. If you look in one of the passages about Jesus, Matthew 8, verse 20, he says, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. It kind of makes you want to shed a tear, doesn't it, when you think about our, the nomadic existence of Jesus. He didn't worry about it, did he? Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9 that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. How poor? Very, very poor. Very poor. He and his disciples had so little tribute money that uh, they actually gives instructions for them to find tribute money in the mouth of a fish. And so Jesus had very little. It's amazing that Judas Iscariot could covet that little amount of money that Jesus and his disciples had, wouldn't it? But he didn't have much as far as material possessions were concerned, even though he was a multi-billionaire as far as heaven was concerned. And this same Savior is going to be exalted, of course, and is above all names. We realize that. But they had to let him stay in a borrowed tomb. Like we said, he didn't need it long, did he? Thirdly, his uh, burying place was a new tomb. Makes sense because Jesus deserves the very best. This Jesus was spat upon. I want you to look at two different scenes with me. Scene number one, Jesus is led out to the people. He stands before the people. He's wounded. He's bruised. A mock scepter in his hand. They've taken this crown of thorns. They've placed upon our Savior's head, as the song reminds us of. And it's, there's blood flowing. Now, I doubt if he could even see very well because of the blood that's filled up the orbital sockets. And so he's there in this position, and he's looking out and not seeing very much that's going on. And these people are reviling him. They are blaspheming him. And then he is led to this cross, and there he's placed upon this cross of Calvary, lifted up from the ground, and spikes into his hands, into his feet, as he is suffering and bleeding and dying on the cross. That's scene one. Scene two, though. Look over the book of Revelation, if you will, and look at Revelation chapter 5, 9 through 12. Revelation 9 through 5, 9 through 12. Probably to do this one justice, we might not even pick it up a little bit before it gets to verse 9. Because I looked and I beheld, he said, 
And in the midst of the throne, and the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, there was a lamb who stood as though it had been slain. Seven, seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, you've made us kings and priests to our God. We'll reign on the earth. I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. <clears throat> the living creatures, the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. And they said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. That's what Jesus deserves. Go with me back to the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, and look at Malachi chapter 1. Verses 6 through 8. What does Jesus deserve? Does he deserve the very best or what? If you look in Malachi chapter 1, and if you uh, look at verses 6 through 8, a son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts? To you priests who despise my name, yet you say, well, in what way have we despise your name? You offer defiled food on my altar. But say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, isn't it evil? When you offer the lame and the sick, isn't it evil? Offer it to your governor. See if he's pleased with it, says the Lord of hosts. But now, what we look at as we notice on this particular passage, Jesus parallels to what God says he deserves. He deserves the best. You offer to Jesus the best. So he deserved Bless his heart. Of all things he had gone through, at least give our Savior a new tomb to lay and be at rest in. Don't you think? Fourthly, <clears throat> his tomb, his burying place, was a transforming tomb. You know, we think about different things that makes an impact on people's lives. And like we say often, we may focus in on the resurrection, of course. And when you think about James, his own <laughs> brother, who writes the book of James, apparently that's what got to him. Because I don't see James hanging around too much around this, the cross, do you? But before Jesus even had arisen from the grave, his burial place, his death, was already something that some individuals, such as Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, were already thinking about. Notice it said concerning Joseph, he took courage. He got stronger, didn't he, as he saw the death of Jesus. Here's a man who saw the death of Jesus Christ. He's not waiting for him to arise from the grave yet. But he is already overwhelmed by the power of Jesus. He's probably thinking about his life. He's probably thinking in terms of the miracles. He's probably thinking about the teachings of Jesus. How no man ever spake like that. Nicodemus, you remember him in John 3? Sort of just slipping in, sliding in here at night. I wonder if I could talk to you a little bit, Jesus, about different things. Maybe he was expecting Jesus to say, Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews, I can't believe we've got you on our team. This is going to be great. This is going to be great. I'll probably make a few concessions for you here and there. He says, Nicodemus, you know the way it works, don't you? You've got to be born again. What do you mean? I should go back to my mother's womb? You know, or, no, I'm telling you, you must be born again of water and the Spirit. That's the only way you're going to get into heaven. He didn't pull any punches. He didn't make any concessions. He said, this is the way it's going to be. You won't get to heaven without being born again, Nicodemus. I think that jarred Nicodemus. May have insulted him, I don't know. May have humiliated him, I'm not sure. But I believe he did some thinking about all that. Because when you go lugging 100 pounds of aloes to bury somebody with, you're not a secret disciple anymore. Where are you going, Nicodemus? Um, Joseph of Arimathea and I are going to be doing a burial for Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's not very secretive, is it? He let people know openly that he was now a follower of Jesus. And as it's been said so many times, either the discipleship will destroy the secrecy or the secrecy will destroy the discipleship. You can't have both. 
And so not like the slimy, slippery Pontius Pilate who says, I don't know what to do with him. I don't think I should kill him. Even my wife's been worried over. She's had bad dreams about him, so I think I'll just wash my hands of the whole thing. Uh, if you interview Jesus, interviewed Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they're going to tell you, yes, we love Jesus. We're going to follow him. That tomb transformed those men, and it has the same impact on people today. Also, that tomb was a symbolic place. The beautiful passage of Romans chapter 6, 1 through 6. Don't you love that passage? Paul starts out with a challenge. You know, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. I still love that King James rendering of that. My new King James says, certainly not. But how shall we who are dead to sin, or who died to sin, live any longer in it? Don't you know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death, therefore were buried with him through baptism into death, that like Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. If we've been planted or united together with him in the likeness of his death, we'll be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. I don't know why it took me so long to put all this together. But I think I was maybe around 14 years old, and I got a phone call on a Saturday night. And my preacher said, I can't be at church tomorrow. I'm not going to be able to be there. I've talked to the elders about it. We want you to preach a sermon tomorrow morning. 14 years old. I had no business up there trying to preach a sermon. So I thought, I need to put some things together. And I made this amazing discovery. Did you know that baptism is a reenactment of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> That's just, I just couldn't believe it. I just thought, this is, I'm, I'm going to blow these people away when I bring this truth out to them tomorrow morning. I'm just, they're going to be stunned. Somebody may do, like one time whenever a Bats, or not Bats, or Baxter, I was talking to Brother Johnson about him a few minutes ago, but um, one of the uh, uh, big-time preachers back many years ago, restoration preacher, was preaching, and, uh, and then there was another one of those guys, it's Barton W. Stone was who was doing the preaching. Alexander Campbell was in his audience, and in the middle of Barton W. Stone's lesson on the covenants, how we're under the new covenant, the old's been done away with, he jumped up, Brother Campbell did, and said, Glory be to God and praise to his name. I thought, somebody will probably say something like that tomorrow when it hits them at Matt Broom's Chapel, Church of Christ, that that is a reenactment of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so, uh, and I loved that concept when I learned it then. I'm sure somebody had already told me a hundred times, but that's when it sunk into my head. And I love it now. When you die, uh, when you're baptized into Christ, you die to your sins, buried in that watery grave, and you come out as a new creation, a new creature. I like that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. The old man has passed away. If I'm going to become a Christian, if I'm going to be baptized, I better make sure that old man, indeed, is going to pass away. Because he can be mean and he wants to hang around a long time. And then... The sixth point is that burying place was an empty tomb. And Luke 24, 3 did not find the body of Jesus. And you can keep looking for it and you'll never find the body of Jesus. It's not there. Every major religion on earth founded by different individuals claiming to be great prophets, whoever they were, they're resting in that tomb right now. But not Jesus Christ. Not with Christianity. Nobody is there. He's gone. He is risen. And so that's an empty tomb. And we are thankful for that. And that's why we sing songs like, Up from the grave he arose. And we are praising our Father in heaven because it truly is a comforting tomb. Um, on Tuesday, Lord willing, we'll have a funeral service. And I probably will end up using a passage about like this one that I'm going to read to you right now. First Thessalonians 4. <clears throat> verse 13 I don't want you to be ignorant brethren concerning those who have fallen asleep you know we worry so much over death to God for those who are Christians it's just falling asleep lest you sorrow as those who have no hope if we believe Jesus died and rose again even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus verse 16 the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel with the trumpet of God the dead in Christ will rise those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we'll always be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. Paul points out to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 23, the glorious passage there that says to us, Christ is risen from the dead. He's become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 
since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. As in Adam all die, and Christ all will be made alive. Each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. John 5, 28, 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves will hear his voice and shall come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. That's an empty tomb, and what a comfort it gives to us when we think about that fact that we can praise our Father in heaven, we can rejoice, that we can be Christians. This evening, if you've not obeyed the gospel, Lord, what a wonderful time to become a Christian. I can't imagine there being a better time. This is the day of salvation. Uh, we want you to come believing in Jesus and turn away from your sins. Tell it. Tell your faith in Jesus. I believe in him, you say. And then be buried into Christ to have your sins washed away, buried in the watery <coughs> grave of baptism. If you look at your life and you say, I want to do better, I want to live a stronger Christian life, I've not been doing right, I want to get serious about this Christianity, or some other way you feel like your life has not been pleasing in God's sight, if you want us to pray for you, be honored to do that. If you need to respond to this wonderful, precious invitation, we invite to you now, invite you now to come to Jesus as we stand to sing.